die hard they would not allow us to damage the Fox Plaza building. So we had to build miniatures of the Fox Plaza and then crash the helicopter off the top of it. With miniature pyrotechnics, you have to make everything burn much slower and still have enough power to destroy the, the device. Rolling and speed. The helicopter was ignited, then a computer was triggered which lit the fire on the building, threw the helicopter off. We were basically hired to patch up problems they couldn't get in live action. Hollywood's full-scale action scenes create the appearance of high explosives with calculated precision. For the production of Demolition Man, special effects coordinator Joe Ramsey is responsible for the planning and execution of a number of scenes featuring pyrotechnics. Uh, we know what our fires are going to do ahead of time. And the reason we know what they're going to do is what we've done before. We've done it before, we know what it's going to do and uh, all your precautions, you know, all the safety is done up front. There's so many different types of fires. Uh, one type of fire would be, let's say, we'll start with the basics, propane type fires, where you're running control. I have a propane bottle, I have a hose, it goes to a propane bar. This is a slotted bar, now it's gonna go ahead and give flame. I know it's only gonna flame where I put these bars. It's only gonna flame as high as I allow the propane bottle to go. The opening scene of Demolition Man involves a complex explosion using 13 cameras, two helicopters, and the destruction of an abandoned Department of Water and Power building in downtown Los Angeles. In this film here, we deal with a lot of explosions and fire and, and also very dangerous stunts, but I don't know, it's just something that I, I think that it, it's, if you can do it, it just adds a, a lot to the movie. Joel Silver, who's the producer on this show, said, Joe, I want a lot of fire, I love fire. I want a lot of fire on this building. Now, I can't have it mass the building though when the building falls. And we said, oh, okay. So in talking with the rest of the group, we went ahead and devised to what we thought was best and we did do some tests to where we changed harder pushes in certain areas, lighter gas, heavier gas in other areas. We had did so many tests on to how long a fireball would last. And granted, you're not doing it on the scale of that to where when you're on such a big scale, you know, it's gonna, you have variables. It can last a little longer, a little shorter. But we thought we had it down to what was the right mount. Hollywood pyrotechnics create huge explosions by using slow burning materials to give the blast shape and color for the cameras to photograph. Or we'll use gasoline or uh, naphthalene or benzol or hydro fire, diesel fuel. Each one gives you a different color. Some are red, some are red and yellow. Go to any alcohol and it's more of a blue. Let me mix it all, it depends on what the uh, director wants to see. We can give you a totally blue fireball, green fireball, red fireball. To create fireballs, a large steel pan called a mortar is used to shape the charge. If I wanted to make that fireball go wider and less high, I'd take and use a dish mortar, which would look like a big bowl. That would allow the fire to be thrown out. You gotta remember a bomb throws in 360 degrees, so what we're doing is directionally in the bomb. What we're doing there is you notice that's a V mortar, it's directioning it up like that. So all the push is up and out. Uh, dish mortar would allow it to throw even further out. If I wanted to throw a f fireball straight up, I'd use what they call a shotgun mortar. That would be basically a piece of pipe that would direction it like a rifle barrel, straight up. And here is a little three ounce black powder bomb. And uh, that's going to be our lifter for the actual gas. That'll atomize it, lift it, spread it out. What he's tying in right now is a flash pack. That'll actually ignite the gasoline. Motion picture pyrotechnics are set off electrically using a 12 volt motorcycle battery. What I'm doing is tying in a button so I can set this off with just a button type. Three, two, one. For a fiery explosion, mortars with gasoline were set directly behind every window. 
The full-scale collapse of the structure was prepared by another group called Controlled Demolition International. The building explosion was uh, probably the, one of the best explosions I've got to work on. And the reason being is it was being tied in with the second company where you actually have the building drop afterwards. So we made the outsides heavy gas where they would continue to roll and burn. The inside we made quick bursts of gas so it burn, disappear, and uh, as you see in the film, when it disappears and clears, you get to see the whole building fall. That was a big shot, but it's only one time. So you're going, oh, come on. In action films, pyrotechnic shootouts are carefully choreographed. The safety of the actors and stuntmen is the first priority. In the early days of motion pictures, slingshots with marbles or ball bearings created the illusion of bullets striking objects. Slingshots with chalk left a puff of dust on impact, representing ricocheting bullets. Today's Hollywood shootouts use miniature charges known as squibs to create the illusion of bullet hits. Another faster method is the use of a small air gun to create bullets raking a scene. Okay, yeah. what's your, is that your gun hand? Yeah. Okay, here. We use this mainly so there's no wiring, it's uh, faster. It will spark as though a ricocheted bullet hits a car or metal or concrete. Classic horror characters continue to delight audiences. They are created from the imagination and ingenuity of Hollywood's special effects makeup artists. In the silent picture, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, starring John Barrymore, there was only ordinary stage makeup to help the actor define the transformation between Jekyll and Hyde. It was the actor's facial contortions and body movements that created Hyde's dark character. Dr. Lon Chaney's simple makeup box contained little more than grease paint and mortician's wax, but his mastery of the art of makeup led him to develop a number of extraordinary characters. One of Chaney's most famous characters was Quasimodo in Victor Hugo's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. It took Chaney three hours a day to apply the nose putty, plaster hump, and leather harness that kept him in a stooped position necessary for the character. Janie's performance was a mastery of body gestures expressing emotions hidden under a thick layer of makeup. In 1924, Cheney began filming his most famous and memorable role, The Phantom of the Opera. In addition to his extraordinary makeup, Cheney knew that the placement of lights could either ruin or enhance his creation. He tested various makeup and lighting to determine the correct impact on screen. When the audience finally sees the Phantom unmasked and views him in all his horror, they are repelled. But as Cheney's character reacts to the knowledge of losing his love, he wins their sympathy. Universal Studios makeup artist Jack Pierce created Frankenstein, The Wolfman, and The Mummy, and inspired future generations. One of the youngest artists influenced by these pictures was Rob Bottin, who won an Academy Award for his work on Total Recall. Um, actually, I was a big uh, fan of monster movies since I was seven, and I always wondered who were these guys that made these creatures. So I actually started uh, reading comic books and going to the library and trying to look up the history of makeup. 
So actually in one comic book I found out that there were a couple of guys that were still alive, one of which was Dick Smith who did The Exorcist. And I was a really big fan of his, you know. So uh, then they ran an article on his protege who was Rick Baker. And, uh, uh, you know, I sent Rick a uh, picture that I had drawn when I was a kid and, in exchange for his autograph. And Rick saw this picture and he said, I don't believe that a 14-year-old kid can draw like this. So he had me brought out to his studio in North Hollywood and, and uh, he asked me if I wanted to work for him. Every monster that I make is uh, totally different. I really uh, just like to imagine things. You know, I'm a big daydreamer. It's rare that you'll actually see me. You know, people always say, God, you know, it, it's great what you do for a living. You know, you just sit there and you, you think. <laughs> you know, like, and, and that's what I do. You know, I just sit there and, and like I start daydreaming and thinking this stuff. And much like a writer, you know, would write, you know, you face the blank page. I sit and I think, well, let's see, what, what's this going to be like and why, you know? One of Rob's most original designs was for the cyborg in Robocop. The Robocop suit evolved into a stylized human form, which took about eight months to finalize. Total Recall, uh, of course, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, was a really, really neat opportunity again because I got to work with uh, Paul Verhoeven, the guy that directed Robocop. And um, Paul, you know, again said, do whatever you want, you know. And uh, one scene in particular, which I really like, is when Arnold is uh, trying to uh, escape the bad guys. And he disguises himself as this big, heavyset lady. What if he's got on, like, this futuristic mask? And what happens is the mask malfunctions. You know, they're questioning him, and all of a sudden the mask malfunctions, starts repeating the same thing over and over. And then all of a sudden the head opens up like, you know, Venetian blinds, you know, boom, 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 and reveals Arnold like that, 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 that. Paul says, well, can you do this? You like that? And I said, well, I don't know how to do it, but I mean, would that, wouldn't that be neat? Would you like that? And he goes, oh, certainly, this would be great. So he said, do it. So that's in the movie, and then, you know, that movie was the first time I won an Academy Award for my special effects. Another way creature creators bring movie monsters to life is stop-motion animation. In 1933, King Kong, the most famous monster of all time, was brought to life by Willis O'Brien. After half a century, this basic technique is still effectively used. On Ghostbusters, I was called in to see the Terror Dog characters. I redesigned them based on their concepts and then uh, sculpted uh, the miniature stop-motion puppet, which is a quarter scale. Uh, oversaw the uh, sculpting that Mike Hosh led of the larger, full-size versions because they worked both as stop-motion puppets and as full-size on-set props. And then uh, actually did the animation of the uh, characters when they were running around and leaping and doing all that sort of thing. Stop motion is a process that utilizes the uniqueness of the movie making illusion where you uh, actually are seeing a series of still images projected in rapid succession to give the illusion of movement. With stop motion you fool the mind by shooting a succession of still images in what you infer would be the uh, increments that they would appear had this character you're pushing around been moving in the real world, in real time. When you're ready to shoot the frame, you turn on the camera controller. It interlocks the camera and the projector. This character is photographed after the live action has been photographed. You shoot a frame of the uh, creature in conjunction with a single frame of movie film projected behind it. There are all sorts of ways uh, to bring creatures to life, of course. Stop motion is one of many. Puppetry is the art of manipulating characters. Today, with the use of computers, puppets are taking on a life of their own. Hello everyone, I'm the big new star of the big new movie, Gremlins 2, The New Batch. And here's someone very special to tell you all about it. The technology is evolving so quickly that um, the things that we're doing in this picture now, we couldn't have done six years ago in the other movie. Because the lip sync is so difficult to perform live and take so many people, uh, and because Tony Randall talks so quickly in, in this film, uh, I decided that the best way to do that is to pre-program all the, all the lip sync dialogue and perform the rest of it live. 
then we actually just program the upper lip first, and then the lower lip and the tongue and the jaw, each in a separate pass. And then the gilder flute will play it back at the uh, at real time. Boy, this is a really good movie! And there you have it. A true unsolicited testimonial from Gizmo himself in his very own words. So listen to Gizmo. You know he'd never lie to anyone. <laughs> If a little gizmo or a gremlin is crawling along the floor, there's usually a hole in the floor. And so it's always a big question mark as to where this hole needs to be. So first we start out with a small hole, about three inches, and then later on at the end of the day or the end of this, the shooting of this particular sequence, the set will look like Swiss cheese because there's holes all over the place. They're not three inches, but they're this big. In the second movie, we had uh, already had the experience of doing the first movie, so we were much more prepared and knew pretty much what had been done before and what we wanted to do differently. It's in a sequel, you have to try to top the first picture. And there were a lot of things that were just not technically possible for us on the time and budget that we had in the first movie um, that we knew we would have to have in this picture. So when we went to Rick Baker, um, when we were writing the script, we tried to include him. They came to me before the script was even finished, and I said, you know, why don't we do this, why don't we do this, and this would be a really thing to try, you know, and they added that stuff in the script, and, and every day that we shot, we made up stuff, you know, Joe says, you know, what, what are we going to have him do today, you know, I was like, well, I don't know, what do you want him to do, he goes, well, you know, I'm throw stuff, you know, I said, well, how about if we do this, and he goes, okay, so, you know, that's what was fun about working with Joe, he's real open for suggestion, to create a character, we'll start with a, a two-dimensional sketch, I usually do drawings first, and sometimes full-color paintings. We sculpt the new features, make molds of those parts. In, in those molds, we put rubber, which has to be baked in the oven, foam rubber usually. And it's painted, and you put hair on it, and, and the mechanics are built for it. It has facial hair mechanics. It really varies for each thing. I wouldn't exactly know how to tell somebody how to do this, and because on the surface, it just looks like you point the camera at it, and you, know, you turn it on, and you turn it off. But in fact, the number of puppeteers there are and the you know, amount of communication that has to go on to get even the simplest thing to happen when you want it um, is just something that comes with practice. Until the 1970s, the movies were still employing many of the same special effects techniques developed in the 1920s and 1930s. In 1975, George Lucas formed Industrial Light and Magic and took model photography and optical printing to new heights. John Dykstra orchestrated the spectacular motion control photography that used computers to move both the camera and models precisely. What we came up with is a way of controlling the camera and the subject relative to one another, basically recording the moves that each of those pieces make. And this became what we commonly refer to as motion control. Now, what this allows you to do when you're doing miniature photography is to lay down separate elements of film with different subject matter on them that are all matched together with the same move. This technique created the thrilling space battles the audience loved. This is the Star Wars optical printer right here.